Okay, so for the third part of our first lecture, we're going to look at the readings I assigned from the textbook on the slave trade. So this is a really tragic part of British history, but an incredibly important one to know. Um, just for our own understanding of the horrible things that have happened throughout human history, as well as for understanding how it um, influences the Romantic period. So here's a picture... It just kind of, you know, exemplifies the cruelty of what was happening at the time. The picture being on a ship, though, also emphasizes how travel across the oceans was such an integral part of the thing. So here's some of the background the textbook goes over. In their constitution, the Britons prided themselves on safeguarding individual liberty but their de economy depended on the slave trade. This is one of the reasons it took them so long to abolish it, is abolishing it would radically change their economy, similar to what happened <clears throat> in the U.S. after the Civil War. But um, they really believed in individual liberty. In the Romantics, as writers really believed in individual literature, liter individual liberty, excuse me, which is one of the reasons why the writers took up this cause and why these abolitionist writings are part of the romantic traditional literature. The slave trade was triangular in that one, they would kidnap or, or buy people in Africa and they would sell the slaves in the New World, which is not just America, but also the West Indies, and then return to Britain with colonial goods such as tobacco, rum, and sugar. These colonial goods were part of people's daily lives. People purchased tobacco, rum, and sugar in Britain, but they didn't really realize that slave labor was an integral part of how they received these goods, and that was the problem. They needed to know this. So the literature of abolition began in the 1780s, and um, it took as its subject matter this goal, helping the British people who smoked tobacco, drank rum, and ate sugar, see that these things they loved to consume were only available to them because of the horrible things that people were doing to other human beings. And so that was the goal of abolition. And the way they decided to approach that was through poems and stories, by telling people what happened to the slaves, by sharing the stories of the slaves, they saw that as the best means of awakening people to what was going on. And so this really, this, this point of British history here really shows the power of literature to influence culture. And um, it worked, I guess, is what I'm trying to say is not right away, but in 1807, um, eventually slavery was abolished. Now, we should note that slavery was abolished because in the early 19th century, the abolitionists took on a different rhetorical strategy from the one I just outlined above, which is that Napoleon in 1802 introduced slavery to France. And so they started to say, hey, look, Napoleon's doing this. You don't like Napoleon. And then, OK, they outlawed it. But there were so many people pushing for abolition over this, you know, 27 years or so, that um, you really can see the influence of the literature. More and more people supported the abolitionist moment leading up to these events in the early 19th century because of the power of those stories. So even though the thing about Napoleon and France is why they are eventually able to get slavery abolished, <clears throat> their their literary strategy didn't fail. It convinced so many people to join the abolitionist cause. Um, and so abolition writing, obviously it's incredibly important because it helped end slavery, but also it's important as part of romanticism. With Blake and Wordsworth and the other writers, it should be considered part of the romantic literary canon. Um, and it embodies a lot of the same themes as romanticism, rebellion and revolution. You know, they were trying to change the laws to help humanity, individual liberty. Um, so it's very ro romantic themes and ideas contained within the abolitionist literature, I guess is what I'm saying.
And so for our abolitionist writer, we looked at John Newton, specifically his song, Amazing Grace. And I chose this reading because this song, I mean, you probably know it. You've maybe even sung it at some point. It depends on, you know, your background. But most people are familiar with this song. People from all different beliefs and cultures are. And so you probably know this song, but you might not know that it was really like became intertwined with the movement. And so I thought it would be one of the more interesting pieces to look at from the collection of abolitionist writings in our textbook. Um, I should mention that I wanted to assign a lot more of these, but I could have just assigned so much for this first lesson, especially being your first lesson. I wanted to try to keep not overload you with too much reading, try to keep it as minimal as possible. So in your own time, if you want to go look at more of the Appalachian writing, you can and you should. Um, but um, I didn't assign any more beyond Amazing Grace for the sake of time and not giving you too much reading. One of the best writers, I think, is Equiano, because you get to see his own narrative, his life as a slave. But he's also included in the American um, anthology of literature, the Norton Anthology of American Literature. So you'll get lots of opportunities to read Equiano's story and other slave narratives and other abolitionist writings and other classes. Um, okay, so another reason why, and I have to apologize, I'm sorry, uh, the bullet points are all here at once instead of coming in individually. I, I just forgot to set the slide that way when I made the slide. Um, so hopefully you can follow along and still pay attention. But uh, another reason why it's important to study John Newton and Amazing Grace for this part of the unit is because most of the abolitionists assume the Christian ethos as their approach to abolition. And so the Christian ideology that's embedded in the poem or the song Amazing Grace is key to understanding how the abolitionists approach um, their mission. And so we real quickly revisiting that Christian narrative arc we talked about with Blake of creation, fall, redemption. Um, the abolitionists use that as their framework, um, mainly the idea of sin and redemption, sin being what happens with the fall. So in Christianity, all human beings are fallen. They're, we're all sinful in the Christian worldview, but through Christ, we can all be redeemed if we believe in Christ. And so God's great. This is what Newton is saying is amazing, is that um, we're these fallen individuals, undeserving of grace and redemption, but Christ gives us this amazing grace. And um, it's available to everyone, black, white, girl, female, etc. So um, that's the argument. The, most of the people in Parliament were Christians or identified as Christians. And so using that basic principle, if you read your Bible, that's there, that, that Jesus came to save all, you know, John 3.16, um, then we should not have slaves is the argument. So, you know, Amazing Grace, the song, doesn't directly address slavery, but the belief that underpins that song, the implication of that is that we should never have slaves. Now, one thing I want to note here as we talk about this is that the textbook actually critiques John Newton and other Christian abolitionists. It argues from, makes this argument from Newton's biography because he sailed on several um, slave ships after his conversion to Christianity. And his, what he's talking about in Amazing Grace is his own change. He was huge into debauchery and, and lived what most Christians would see as a very sinful life. Um, before he was transformed, he argues by God and, and, and talks about that transformation in the song Amazing Grace. But after he became a Christian, he was not initially opposed to slavery. Later in his life, he became opposed to slavery. And so the textbook takes that piece of information from his biography and tries to cast, I would say, a very negative view of Newton and other Christian abolitionists. So I want to push back a little bit on what the textbook says there and hopefully try to expand 
your view of the situation a little bit. What the textbook says is abolitionist preoccupation with their own spiritual welfare would overshadow sometimes their consciousness of African suffering. What they're saying is that Newton was too focused on his own spiritual well-being. It took him longer than it should have, I guess, to realize slavery was bad. My pushback is the fact that he eventually realized that slavery was bad and came out publicly against it and used his own song, Amazing Grace, to say that this grace should be available to all people. That right there is what's important. Even if he did some terrible things after he became a Christian, um, that doesn't mean that he didn't make a great point about how and why um, all slaves should be free. And, and so I just wanted to push back on that a little bit, but I think it underscores the fact that the textbook brings this up. I think that fact underscores something really important to understand about Christianity and how the Romantics pushed back on Christianity, because the Romantic period was a time in which many came away from Christianity, and, and many of the poets we studied were atheists, and they found their spirituality in nature. So there's a, a clear distinction here of a Christian worldview versus a non-Christian one that's important to understanding Romanticism, and important to understanding how the Christian view was important to abolition, but that some people see it as not being as focused on abolition as it could be. So I'm trying to help clarify the Christian abolitionist view and at the same time outline a tension for romantics that had to do with Christianity, if that makes sense. And it comes back to what we talked about with Blake and the two different thesis statements about Blake that I gave you. And it has to do with Christian action. So the Christian view is we should fight for abolition, but no matter what we do, no matter what we achieve, this is a fallen world. And the fact that it's fallen is why something like slavery exists in the first place and that we have hope in a better world in heaven where there will be no slavery of any kind. Um, and so you can see how the Christians would make a good case for abolition from their worldview. Uh, but non-Christians, uh, I'm assuming here the editors of the textbook who critique this view, they're saying, yes, we fight for abolition, but that's the most important thing. Don't worry about heaven. We have to make this fallen world a better place through our own actions. And so I think the difference makes sense, and I'm not trying to be partial to either one here. I think the textbook is partial to one, and I'm trying to present to you a more um, a view that shows both sides. Um, <clears throat> and so um, what's good is both sides are for abolition. The difference is one side makes abolition the most important thing, and the other side makes abolition a very important thing, but the most important thing is um, Christ's redemption of the fallen world. And so again, it's like a, a God-centric view, versus a human-centric view, which is what we see in Blake, right? Blake takes on this human-centric view where he says, no, humanity has to change the fallen world, not God or Christ. So there's still, they both believe in a fallen world, but how we help the fallen world is different. And, and one believes God will do it, and one believes humans will do it. And in the human-centric view, there's a more of an emphasis on direct human action. Although the other one still, the Christian one still emphasizes human action, just it also emphasizes God, I guess. So hopefully that helps outline the two views more clearly than the textbook does. And I want to conclude by talking about William Wilberforce, who was, you could probably argue, the primary abolitionist during this time. He um, was really inspired by Newton's amazing grace and became the biggest advocate of abolition in Britain. And he um, was rejected over and over again by Parliament until um, the abolitionists took up the argument about Napoleon. Um, but basically, he's one of the main reasons why there's no longer slavery in Britain. And in our textbook, Anna Lolita Barbald's poem talks about William Wilberforce, so that's why I assigned it. Um, but I, I want to wrap up the lecture, so I'm not going to do a close reading of it.
But if you're interested in this subject, there's a biography about William Wilberforce called Amazing Grace by an author, Eric Metaxas. That's a really good biography if you're more interested in this.